Good evening. I'm Leland Vitter. There's new evidence that President Trump plans a 2024 run. We're going to tell you why Republicans plan to stop him that didn't work in 2016 might just work this time around. Plus, puppy snatching for ransom. Why a new breed of criminals target French bulldogs for puppy napping. But first, America got a terrifying reminder this weekend that Muslim terrorism still presents a clear and present danger to the homeland 20 years after 9-11. But curiously, it took the FBI hours, even more than a day, to call it terrorism, and even longer to declare the attack against a Jewish synagogue an anti-Semitic attack. Here's what happened. 44-year-old Malik Faisal Akram allegedly came to America just after New Year's, bounced around homeless shelters and some hostels before his attack Saturday on the Colleyville, Texas synagogue. For over 10 hours, he held four, including the congregation's rabbi, hostage. He demanded the release of a female Muslim terrorist from Pakistan. Much of the credit for everybody coming out alive goes to the FBI's hostage rescue team, HRT, the law enforcement equivalent of SEAL Team 6. The good news is that everybody but the terrorists survived, and kudos to the HRT operators. The bad news starts there. Just about everything else in this case is a real indictment of the FBI, among others. Former FBI Deputy Assistant Director Danny Colson joins us now. He also created and commanded the FBI's HRT team. We're going to get to that in a minute. But first, to sort of the way the FBI has handled this case, uh, this was the press conference uh, given by the head of the Dallas field office as the situation unfolded. Take a listen. Uh, we, we, we do believe from our engagement with this subject that he was singularly focused on one issue uh, and it was not specifically related to the Jewish community, uh, but we're continuing to work to find motive. Continuing to work to find motive. Uh, the AP put out, the FBI said the Texas synagogue hostage takers demands were not specifically focused on the Jewish community, no fault of the AP. Then the FBI revised that on Sunday, calling it a terrorism-related matter in which the Jewish community was targeted. Uh, how can you make such a stunning statement uh, that this was not terrorism after a guy held some four people in a synagogue at gunpoint? Danny, are you there? Oh, yes, I'm sorry. I thought you were waiting for another comment. Oh, I can tell you how it happened. First of all, uh, the FBI needs to understand they are not a show-and-tell operation. There is absolutely no reason to be giving updates to the press. I know you don't like this answer, but there's no reason to do that. What you should tell the people, uh, the press, is that we have an ongoing situation. We haven't sorted it out. And one thing, Leland, it's really important to know this, and that there is a million bits of information coming to the FBI. And rather than get some information out, that may be accurate now, but five minutes later you find it's not accurate, just don't say anything. There's no reason to do that. The most important function here is to save these people's lives and to go out and try to do show and tell and tell everybody what you've concluded this far, thus far. That didn't help anything. And I understand how it happened. Um, it shouldn't. But um, I think they need to reconsider their policy and only put things out at the conclusion of a specific time period where they can verify what they're saying. You don't want to lose your credibility by giving out bad information. It sure feels like there was some political correctness at work because this was after the hostage taker uh, was dead. Uh, and once they knew that he had taken over a synagogue and threatened to blow it up, it, it seems as though it would be pretty obvious at the conclusion of this event that it was terrorism, right? Well, yes, and I think a lot of administrations are reluctant to talk about things as terrorism because they think it reflects badly on their administration. And I think that's a, a huge mistake. And uh, I, I knew it was terrorism. You knew it was terrorism. I, I did terrorism for a living, and it's pretty clear it was terrorism. But the most important thing here, and you said it at the top of the hour, is that we won. We won the Super Bowl. That was a great operation by the local police and the local FBI and obviously the hostage rescue team. I, I couldn't agree with you more, and I want to get to that and, and give those operators the due they deserve. But is the FBI clear-eyed enough, you think, 20 years after 9-11 of the threat of foreign-born Muslim terrorism on the homeland if they can't even call this guy 
a Muslim terrorist once he, they've killed him? <laughs> that, that, that raises issues. Um, we need transparency. The FBI needs to be clear in what they say. But also, don't make a mistake. Um, don't, if you don't know, don't say. And I think that many administrations, including the previous one, um, didn't want to call something terrorism because it looked like they'd failed. And they didn't fail. It's just circumstances. And um, I, I, that, that needs to be addressed. Uh, the attorney general needs to address it with Christopher Wray and to be sure that they give clear mm -hmm. and concise reports. Yeah. Were you, there's been some reporting that MI5, which is the British intelligence services, knew about this guy, that he was a problem in the UK, was certainly on their radar over there. Uh, if he can get in by literally just flying into JFK, who else can? <laughs> uh, good question. Anybody can. You don't have to fly into JFK. You come across at Brownsville. We don't have a border. Um, one thing to remember, too, that just because MI5 knows who he is or MI6 knows who he is, it doesn't mean the FBI has the authority to investigate him. There are attorney general guidelines that very much limit what they can do, and they take a lot of heat for not doing things that you and I know they should do because they can't. Because hmm. the guidelines don't allow them. Yeah, it just it's so I keep coming back to how troubling it is that that after this was over, they still didn't call it terrorism and anti-Semitic terrorism at that. But you you've commented on that. Now now to the fun part of this, which is the FBI's HRT team. How is it that you get 90 guys from Quantico, Virginia, to Texas in a couple <laughs> of in a, in a couple of hours? And does it tell you that when this situation began, they might have had an inkling or had their eye on this guy and realized that there was something more going on. No, I, I commanded that team. I created and I created it and I also created the transportation capability. They are on standby. They are the fastest deploying counter-terrorist team in the world. That's what they do. They practice it every day. They have their own airlift uh, command. Uh, they're ready to go. And, and uh, also one thing you should know, they did a mission just two days earlier. So they're busy boys right now, and thank God we have them, and thank God that every day of their lives they practice deployment and, and assaults and breaching and hostage rescue and all the things they yeah. do, and I'm really, I'm really proud of those guys, I can tell you that. Yeah, and, and, and not only that, they deploy oftentimes, as you know, preemptively, the Super Bowl and other uh, situations oh, like yeah. that. D given the events of this weekend, does the FBI, you think, need to revisit the idea of foreign-born Islamic terrorism as much as President Biden's talking now about the threat of domestic terrorism? Well, they're both important. Um, remember, Timothy McVeigh was a domestic terrorist. I arrested True. him. Uh, we need to do both. Uh, it's not either or. We need to do both. Um, also, we need to remember that we need policemen to do this, too. It's, it's totally inappropriate to talk about defunding police, because that takes away intelligence. Most of the FBI's intelligence come from cops, local law enforcement, sheriff's deputies, and people like that. They, they drive the FBI's intelligence program. And if we're going to talk about defunding them, that's going to hurt our intelligence capability dramatically. Hmm. Uh, no, no kidding, especially when you think about NYPD's uh, surveillance assets oh and some of the some of the bigger police uh, departments. Hey, it's always good to see. You. As soon as this happened, we we said we needed to get you on the air to talk about it, and you did not disappoint as usual. Thank you, sir. Yeah. It's always a pleasure to be with you. Ple pleasure's all ours. Thank you. Tonight on Prime, Brian Enton dives into active shooter training and how that saved so many lives on Saturday. News Nation Prime Nine Eight Central. First hand look you do not want to miss. Once the hostage situation ended, one of the leading Muslim voices in higher education tweeted this. Houston, we have a problem. Now that the hostages are rescued unharmed and safely reunited with their loved ones, we North American Muslims need to have the morally required tough conversations about those, quote, polite Zionists that are our enemies. The reaction from Abdullah and Tepley is making headlines nationwide. He joins us now, founder, director, Muslim Leadership Initiative, associate professor of interfaith relations at Duke. Professor, I really appreciate you taking the time and I appreciate your tweet as well. Expand Thank you, Reagan. good evening. Yeah, I'm, I'm interested in the response. I would guess there's some folks who aren't very happy with you. There are, and I'm not gonna let them ruin the moment. Um, they are in minority. Uh, I have been receiving overwhelming love and support from uh, many Americans, including American Muslims, um, 
even though the dissenting voices who are trivializing the anti-Semitism issue within the American Muslim communities are sometimes louder, they are more active in the social media, they do not represent the majority of the American Muslim communities. This is a very grave issue. When I say Houston, we have a problem that we include Americans as a whole, uh, but also specific to the American Muslim community. Anti-Semitism is all time high. Yeah. And it is increasing, it is morally incumbent upon every community, including American Muslim community, to confront anti-Semitism in any form and shape. I, I'm, I'm interested in, in this. To your mind, was this an anti-Semitic attack first or a oh Muslim goodness. terrorist attack first? We shouldn't even be discussing this. And the fact that we are even trying to name it right is quite shameful. This is a terroristic anti-Semitic incident. This anti-Semitic terror incident, and we should be addressing this as such. And it is not an episodic event disconnected from the broader uh, context of uh, incre incredibly high anti-Semitic environment and anti-Semitic discourse, which is coming, Leland, from every corner of our political spectrum, from center left as well as from center right. Yeah, cer certainly from far left and far right, I'd agree with you. I'm not sure about center, but we can discuss that. I'm interested, though, you think about, for example, what's coming from among other issues, uh, CARE, the uh, Center for American Islamic Relations, talking about uh, freeing the terrorist that the guy in the Texas synagogue was talking about. Uh, right. there's, all, there's all these, there's all sort of these intersections, and at, at some level, uh, it, it feels as though among a lot of Muslims, uh, any action taken by Israel allows a cover to be anti-Semitic. One could see these loud voices and bad faith actors like CARE and American Muslims for Palestine. Um, if they represent the entire American Muslim community, that statement would be categorically accurate, but that's just really not the case. CARE, CARE Council of American Relations, has a long track record of really using American civil liberties fight and fighting with increasing Islamophobia and anti-Muslim rhetoric in the United States as a front to their very toxic, very harmful, very problematic and ethically and morally problematic, embedded in anti-Semitism kind of uh, pro-Palestinian activism. Mm -hmm. And this has to stop. This has to end. In that tweet, I was referring to that uh, American Muslims for Palestine conference. They put out a reprehensible anti-Semitic report, uh, categorically putting 90 plus percent of American Jewish communities as our enemies, as they put it, loyal Zionists so, are so our enemies. You're one of the things that makes you so unusual, Professor, is you're speaking out against this. If it is as obvious and as morally sound as you say it is, and I believe it is, why aren't there more American Muslims who are being vocal about it? Well, they are, uh, but they are not as... Uh, sophisticated, as successful as getting their voice heard within the mainstream well, American Muslim Hold on, Muslim prof pro 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 professor, though, I professor, I've been, to, I, I've been to a lot of mosques and I've spent a lot of time in the Muslim communities uh, ar around uh, New Jersey, uh, some in Chicago, certainly some in Washington, D.C. There's nobody there talking about the problems of anti-Semitism. That's not happening uh, from the pulpits, from the imams. That, that explains my level of frustration. As angry as I am with CARE or Zahra Bilu or American Muslim for Palestine displaying reprehensible anti-Semitism, I am a lot more frustrated and angry with the majority of the Muslim community seemingly silent or ineffective in pushing back and uh, opposing this uh, reprehensible anti-Semitism in the name of American Muslim communities. You are absolutely right in that criticism. It will, I don't know what will it take but we will do whatever necessary that the silent majority has to speak up and do not let these bad faith actors like CARE, Americans for Muslim, American no, Muslims I, for I, no, I, I appreciate you naming names because so many people are afraid to do that when they speak up and all, all, the, all the more to you for to doing it. But, but you've, got, you've got somebody like Ilan Omar who tweets it's all about the Benjamin. She gets political cover from not only the Muslim left, but the left in general. Uh, is this more about a problem on the extremes of the American political divide than it is about uh, a religious issue within the Muslim community? I, it has its religious roots, but it is really a political divide. American Muslim community feel uh, they are held hostage uh, with post-9-11 realities 
And these uh, individuals uh, are really politicizing uh, with their toxic, very far left uh, policies. Uh, and unfortunately, there is no one to counter their, um, their really unacceptable set of behaviors, as you see in this quote, in this tweet, I have, I have denounced and criticized Representative Omar. Yeah, no, I, I, I saw that. Also trafficking of uh, anti-Semitism, and she apologized. But clearly, she has learned very little from her past mistakes yeah. because she kept repeating. She's a repeated offender in this case. Th that would be that would be an understatement. It's interesting. I'm wondering uh, how much you think this has to do with the front page of the Sunday New York Times. Uh, as you said, a terrorist anti-Semitic attack in America on American soil and the front page of the New York Times doesn't have a single story about it. Is there an intersection between what you are warning about and the lack of coverage? Yes, there is. Yes, there is. Regretfully, anti-Semitism uh, and this reprehensible form of hate is being trivialized and not really understood or understood as a far-right problem, only coming from certain political and violent white supremacist groups. And everybody recognizes anti-Semites in their own camp uh, everybody recognizes anti-Semites in the camp of other people, mm. but they are failing to recognize the anti-Semitism and anti-Semites in their own camp. I do not know about this particular page in New York Times, but um, every media outlet, I do not know your media outlet as well, has a fair share of responsibility for so long, not uh, paying enough attention, required attention, into increased levels of anti-Semitism in American society. Yeah, yeah well, I think, Professor, um, you, like me, have uh, received some criticism for calling anti-Semitism what it is. Um, so I would like to think that we don't have the issue that you just brought up, but uh, your point's well made. We appreciate you joining us, sir. Thank you. Um, God bless you and your family. I, I know that Thank you. Uh, ringing the alarm bells us. like and this is a- If you allow me for 30 seconds, I want to express my condolences, love and respect and appreciation to members of the Jewish community, not only in Dallas, but everywhere else. One another shameful fact we didn't get a chance to talk is Professor Deborah Lipstadt, who is nominated by the current president to be the special envoy on studying and combating anti-Semitism, her appointment and nomination has been slowed shamefully in the U.S. Senate. Hmm. Like if you are pained by this anti-Semitic terrorist incident, and if you really believe that this is a problem, I hope at least one major way of dealing with this issue and problem is this incredible professor who gained the respect of everyone will be appointed and her nomination will be confirmed as quickly as possible in our Senate. I, I, I appreciate you speaking out about it. It's an issue, uh, admittedly, I don't know enough about as I should, but uh, since you brought it up, we're gonna look into it. Thank you. Thank you. That would be a worthy program to focus on. We'll, we'll do it. Good to see you, sir. President Trump, former President Trump, has now soft launched his 2024 campaign. We're going to ask George Will if any Republicans are really going to stand in his way or can stand in his way. Nobody, Nobody, cares, about, again? No, no, cares. Be, Nobody cares about what's happening to the Uyghurs, okay? An NBA team owner says he doesn't care about genocide. What happened to the woke NBA? Today, our freedom to vote is under assault. And the proponents of these laws are not only putting in place obstacles to the ballot box, they are also working to interfere with our elections, to get the outcomes they want, and to discredit those they do not. That is not how democracies work. Was the vice president today continuing to push Democrats stalled? Stalled would perhaps be putting it nicely. Elections bill while honoring Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. President Biden had no public events today, curiously, but he is set to have a press conference on Wednesday, a day before the one year mark of his presidency. This year's not going the way the White House planned. The New York Times reports that frustrated Democrats are calling for a reset ahead of the midterm election, saying Bernie Sanders said, I think millions of Americans have become very demoralized. They're asking, what do the Democrats stand for? Clearly, the current strategy is failing, and we need a major course correction. With that, we bring in George Will, News Nation senior contributor, Pulitzer Prize winning columnist. Good to see you, sir. Thank you. Uh, you got to think that Joe Biden's going to get at least one softball question. Mr. President, what are your biggest accomplishments? And he will say what? <laughs> 
Uh, I survived, I guess. Here's his biggest accomplishment, and it's a negative accomplishment. Gallup says that in 2021, Mr. Biden's first year, the party preference poll shifted 14 points against the Democrats and in favor of the Republicans. That's an astonishingly large swing. Now, the Democratic Party is the oldest political party in the world, Leland, and it didn't get this longevity by being suicidal. So the Democratic Party will, I think, adjust. Here's the problem. If, if the country doesn't like your agenda, and the country actually does not like Mr. Biden's agenda, they think it costs too much, change your agenda. That, but that's not enough for Mr. Biden. The country has already decided that there's something about him that he's not quite up to the job, whether it's age, whether it's mediocrity, we don't know. But they've decided that, and it's very hard to shift that once that opinion sets in. The Biden presidency has made you feel pick of the above. I'm not asking you this question. It was asked of the American people. <laughs> uh, frustrated, disappointed, 50%, 49%, 40% nervous, only 25% combined to say calm, 25% satisfied. Uh, you will uh, know the name of the great political scientist who said the power of the presidency is that the power of persuasion. And I'm wondering if what you're getting at is something deeper, deeper than the Biden policies and if there is a history of a presidency that had those feelings. I'm almost thinking in more recent memory, George H.W. Bush. I think that's fair. The, the political scientist you're referring to is Richard Neustadt of Harvard. He was very influential with Jack Kennedy, who understood that the office of the presidency is inherently weak, except that it has an enormous power of persuasion. What strikes me, Leland, about the Biden presidency is he needs a sister soldier moment. For those of you who don't remember, in 1992, Bill Clinton, young man running for president, uh, sister soldier, an African-American entertainer, said some phlegm, fiery, irresponsible things about black people ought to be killing white people. And Bill Clinton pounced on this and distanced himself from it. What amazes me about the Clinton presidency is defund the police cost them a lot of votes in, nine, in 2021, and he never came out against it. Mm. Today, parents are up in arms about the right of parents to control, have some influence on what public schools are teaching their children. Where is the president on this? More to the point, the city of New York has recently said 800,000 non-citizens will be allowed to vote in their elections. Where does the president stand on non-citizens voting? These are occasions for the president to distance himself from the progressives to whom he's shown an allegiance that's been very costly to him. Yeah, it's fascinating to me. You think about Bernie Sanders, you said clearly the current strategy is failing. We need a major course correction. So much of President Biden's core Democratic constituency would want to double down on being more progressive, the base of that, and you'd have conceivably you, the person who would pander to the base and allow the president to tack to the center would be the vice president, and they're not using her that way. Well, it's, she is not, shall we say, a convincing advocate when she comes into public. Uh, there are all kinds of reports in the press leaking from her own staff that says she does not prepare, she doesn't like to do briefings and all the rest. When she does talk on the record, what comes out often is a kind of confused word salad that it does not give you an infusion of what the Biden administration needs at this time, which is confidence. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's interesting also at the same time, and you noted the Gallup switch in party preference, the leading Republican candidate in 2024 is not taking advantage of this. He's relitigating the past. Uh, former President Trump in front of uh, 15,000 people on Saturday. Take a listen. I love Arizona. We had a tremendous victory in Arizona that was taken away. We had a rigged election, and the proof is all over the place. They say, while it is unsubstantiated and the big lie, uh, the big lie, the big lie is a lot of bullshit. That's what it is. Why does Trump think this is going to work? He's been, he, he has very few pedals on his organ, and he works them until they break. Forty years ago, he was talking about the danger of Japan. He's just plugged in the name China, and it's the same song over and over again. Yeah. 
Remember, Mr. Trump, Mr. Trump believes it is theoretically impossible for him to lose. He's a strong person, strong people don't lose, which is why he seems determined to go into this election looking to the past. One of the things Bill Clinton understood perfectly and said quite succinctly is elections are about the future. Hmm. And if the Republicans go into the 2024 election saying, let's talk about 2020, the, the electorate will turn them out. In, in fairness, then-candidate Trump went through the 2016 GOP field, which was a strong field, like a combine through an Iowa cornfield. You now think about looking at the 2024 field, Alyssa Farah, who used to work for Trump. DeSantis should run, so should Pence, Pompeo, Haley, Cotton, Tim Scott, Sununu, Hogan. Credible Republicans with governing experience should challenge Trump. There's zero reason to nominate Trump when ours have a bench and Biden is polling in the 30s, except for the fact that Trump is by far and away the most popular person in the Republican Party, and there's nobody on the 2024 list who's stronger than the 2016 list he defeated. Not at this point, but things change in politics. You know, the old saying, Leyland, is that overnight is a long time and a week is forever in American politics. Mr. Trump is shrewd enough to know that if, he, if one person runs against him, it would better to have 18 run against him. Mm. That was his great advantage in, 20, uh, 20, in uh, 2016. There were 18 or so Republicans on the stage, and he was the most flamboyant. He was the one who stood out, and he did the best. Uh, I, d I think what he really does not want is one or two people running against him. He really wants 10. Mm. That's a good point. Uh, as always, Mr. Will, good to see you. Mondays with George Will on On Balance. We'll see you next week, sir. Thank you. Good to see you. Good to see you. Thanks. Coming up, Spotify is one of the world's biggest audio streaming services, otherwise known as podcasters, but they don't have much to say about the outrage over Joe Rogan. We think we know why. That's next. We've been talking certainly about the big crime wave of murders and carjackings that have swept American cities. There's a new breed of criminal taking aim at man's best friend and ripping dogs right out of the hands of their owners. Specifically, they're targeting French bulldogs. Not only are the dogs being stolen at an alarming rate, but they're being taken violently as well. Here's some video from West Hollywood where you can see a man being dragged after someone grabbed his bulldog off the sidewalk. Why French bulldogs? Well. They're small, they're easy to grab, they're pricey, running an average of $1,500 to $3,000 a piece. Top breeders sell them from $5,000 and up. Needless to say, those who own them are well off and at times willing to pay big money to get them back. Joining us now, canine private investigator Tara Tarquin, who's helped reunite owners with their missing pets for more than a decade. 18 years, 3,000 pets. Uh, Karen, appreciate you being with us. Is this really a big yeah. increase in dog napping? I would say that it is an increase, but it's also what the increase is, is the, the way in which they're doing it. I mean, certainly French Bulldogs have been targets for a period of time, um, but, but I would say that not violently taken. They've been taken from home invasions. And is this, are they taking these dogs to resell them or to ransom them? I would say it's probably a little bit of both. I would, you know, your professionals, the ones that have a system that are doing this uh, methodically, probably have a ransom in mind. I, I mean, I have to be honest that in the cases where we have got these dogs back, there almost always is a substantial reward. It's, you know, it, we, we have had a case this morning, for instance, a young six month old that disappeared last Thursday and nobody has seen the dog. And um, we, we have a, we believe that French bulldogs, when, once they hit the street, like if they get out of their yard or they're out of their, out of their house by accident, the, the time on the street is usually less than three minutes. Wow, so there's people driving around. French bulldogs, obviously they're small, they're docile, they're easily resellable. There's not a lot of people dog napping, Rottweilers, German shepherds or Newfoundlands, I'm guessing. Not, not, in, not, not in the way that we are talking about. A lot of this has to do with a desirability factor. There's a little bit of a status in the fact that the French Bulldog is an expensive dog. Certainly we've had this happen, by the way, with English Bulldogs. It's happened with 
um, golden doodles. Yeah. So, but how does it? How does it? I, I get the reselling to pet shops and that kind of thing. Although selling a six-month-old pet seems a little odd, but put that on the side. How does a ransom work? Is it sort of a faked as a reward that you just agree not to ask any questions, and then someone calls and says, "Oh, I might know where my dog is." Uh, the, the people that hire us, they're not trying to make a political statement. They want their family members back. So when we offer a reward, quite frankly, in many cases, especially with the French Bulldog and the English Bulldog, we know we are probably going to be giving a ransom or, or a reward to the bad guy. I mean, yeah. we, we, we've got this it, is up to the pet owner. Yeah, and you say you say family members. That's what they are. Uh, you're talking to an entire right. show of of dog lovers. So this this story is personal. We have some pictures of you with some of the folks that you've reunited and and brought back. Lostpetprofessionals.com. That but, was a stolen dog. That dog right there was a stolen dog you just showed. And, and how how did it work? You all do you put out on the internet? Hey, we're offering a big reward. Or does the kidnappers know to contact you, or do they contact the pet owner and say, Oh, I might know where your pet is? Presumably what happens the most, most of the time is we do a campaign in the area. We use signage, we use flyering, we have people try to spread a buzz. When, when you have a dog where the, where the pet owner is going to offer a reward of 3,500 or more, that dog right there that you're showing right now, that was a $5,000 reward. And they gave up their wedding to get that dog back. He was stolen out of a car. This is up to the pet owners, to what they want and to do. do. The, and do the police help out at all? You're talking about big money at this point. Not generally. The, the police are, resources-wise, they have so many crimes. And, and this also speaks to risk factors. I mean, if, if you want to talk to why this happens a lot. Now, once you start using a gun and you're, you're, har you're harm harming people, now you're talking felonies. But for the most part, there is very little risk because the actual penalties for taking a dog, stealing a dog, picking up a dog that's obviously stray and not stray and belongs to somebody, the penalties are very small. Wow. So the risk factor is not, you know, stolen dogs have been going on for a great, you know, a, a long time. And it, it has got, um, it's increasingly mm. got more uh not only visible, but people are actually and taking a, taking a lot more risk. Karen, we got to run, but what yeah. you said, uh, the most important thing you said was that a couple gave up their wedding to get their dog back. That says That's says correct. it all. Thank you very much. We appreciate it and hope to never need your services, but are glad to have had you. Good to see you. Thank In you China, so we might be seeing the beginnings of another Holocaust, but one professional sports team owner says he just doesn't care. Hear what else he's got to say after the break. Thanks for watching. Click the red subscribe button below so you can get more of News Nation's fact driven, unbiased coverage.